Well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Andrew Grantham, and I'm going to be presenting on the case study on sexual assault today. I've titled it The Victims of Sexual Assault, a Case Study into the Decisions and Ethics Involved in an Incident. So this is a pretty sensitive subject overall, and um, I don't know who's in the audience today. Some of you may know people who have been victims of sexual assault. Others of you may have been victimized yourself. Um, and so if you experience any emotional trauma today or you're concerned in any way and you need to get more resources, I unfortunately am not a licensed practitioner or professional in that field. But here's a number to the Blue Bench hotline. Um, they're here locally in the Denver area. Uh, it's a 24-hour hotline that you can call, and, and that's the number there. So I use this quote from uh, who's now the Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter. He said, the more that we dig into sexual assault, the more dimensions we come to understand. And I found this especially true as I've studied how sexual assault affects the military, specifically the Coast Guard. Um, the Coast Guard's definition for sexual assault is uh, any sexual contact that's brought up on by the use of force, threats, intimidation, uh, abuse of authority, or where the victim does not consent or cannot consent. And that's the working definition that I'm going to use for this case study today. So there are two key points that I kind of want to focus on this morning. Um, one is that the perpetrator is also a victim. And I don't mean that in any way to take away from the wrongness of the acts that they commit in a sexual assault. Uh, it's a heinous crime that uh, it can drastically affect someone else's life. But I don't think that someone wakes up one morning and then out of the blue decides that I'm going to sexually assault someone today. I think it's something that happens over time, that it's a slow uh, erosion of the mental psyche that brings you there. It's a culmination of events. And so I use the analogy that this is more like a river that erodes a canyon rather than an earthquake. The earthquake is what the victim experiences. It's extremely sudden trauma, um, a life-altering event if you know anybody who's ever experienced something like this that sometimes takes many years to recover from. They experience feelings of shame, maybe guilt. Uh, they could have fear for their own safety and security, a loss of control, and their ability to leave their lives. And, uh, and those are two overarching aspects that I'd like to, we'll kind of unpack as I go through the case study. So let me talk to you a little bit about Cindy. Cindy is a junior enlisted person in the Coast Guard. Uh, she is a maritime law enforcement specialist at a land-based unit in Charleston, South Carolina. And if you know Cindy, you know that she always wanted to join the Coast Guard to do exactly what she's doing right now. This is her dream job. So she's been there four months and um, she works for kind of an overbearing boss. And I don't know if any of you have had people like this. I know I have. Someone who's a bit of a micromanager who likes to use negative reinforcement to compel some new behavior or compliance. So let's just say that Cindy's had one rough kind of a week. A couple of minor infractions that have been blown out of proportion. She's tired. It's Friday. She comes back to her apartment, runs into her roommate, Samantha, who's not in the Coast Guard. And Samantha being a good friend, recognizes that Cindy's kind of had a tough week, says, you know, let's just get out of here. Let's go have some dinner and just unwind from the week. So Cindy allows Samantha to convince her to go out. They go to their favorite place, share a bottle of wine, and just play over the events of the week, kind of vent a little bit. But it's at that point they form a plan that they want to go out dancing. There's this new place that just opened up in Charleston called Push. Nice little club that's got dancing and music and whatnot. So they're going to go out there. And when they get to push, they run into Jack and James. Jack and James are two of Cindy's co-workers. James is a peer in rank and about age. And I said James. And then Jack is, uh, he's higher ranking than Cindy, but they both work for the same boss, if you can imagine that. So he's pseudo a supervisor to her, um, but not directly her supervisor. So Jack is one of these people who, he's a pretty chill person. Very relaxed, easygoing, you know, just take everything as it comes kind of a person. And so as soon as he sees the, 
women, he waves them over and says, hey, you know, come over here and hang out with us tonight. Uh, Cindy, I know you had one heck of a week. You know, let's, let's just forget about everything that's happened that you got into with your boss or our boss and have a good time. So he buys a round of drinks for everybody, puts the shot in everyone's hand and just says, hey, let's, let's have a good time. So they toast, they drink, and then they mingle and talk for a while. Now, the original plan was to come to dance. So at some point, James grabs Samantha and take, starts to take her out to the dance floor. Now, ladies, maybe you can back me up a little bit. I've seen this happen before. Maybe you have some type of nonverbal cues that you use with your girlfriends that if you're out in a place like this, they... So Cindy, or not Cindy, Samantha gives the, the cues to Cindy that, you know, this, I'm not creeped out by this guy. This is okay. I'm going to go dance with him, the wink or the nod, or whatever you want to call So they go out dancing, and that leaves Jack and Cindy still uh, hanging out and talking. And Jack goes and gets another drink for him and Cindy, hands her another one, says, hey, let's, let's go have a good time. Let's go out and dance. So they take their drink and head out to the dance floor. And Cindy's has a few reservations. I mean, it is a coworker. Um, she doesn't know what people, she doesn't want people talking about this at the office. But at the same time, she's thinking, you know, it's just dancing. I'm just going to go out and have a good time tonight. You're right, I should be able to relax. So they go out on the dance floor, and as they continue to dance, Cindy starts to feel pretty sluggish. Um, you know, just starting to move a little bit slower. At one point, she feels Jack put his hand on her hip, and, and to try to play it nonchalantly, she thinks, well, I'm just gonna take a step back and let the hand fall off. But as she does that, she falls all over herself and just hits the ground pretty hard. Samantha sees that, comes over, Jack's helping her up, and they can see at this point Maybe it's time for Cindy to call it a night. So they, Jack says, you know what? I'll take her back. I know, uh, you know, I can get her back to her place. Samantha, you and James keep having a good time because they seem to really be hitting it off. So they agree to the plan. Jack starts to take Cindy. And he goes to the bar and says to the bartender, hey, two more for the road and then close me out. Now, the bartender knows Jack pretty well. Jack's been coming to push for a while. And this is the fourth time in as many weeks he's seen her, or she's seen him with a different girl. Um, looks at Cindy, can tell that she's already had a little bit to drink, but says, okay, you know, I'll give you guys your drinks, but none of you are driving, right? You all are gonna cab it back. And he says, yes, ma'am, we're gonna take a cab back. So they take their drinks and they leave the bar. So let's fast forward to the next morning. Cindy wakes up with a groan. It is too bright, she's dehydrated, her body aches, and she says to herself something maybe some of you have said to yourselves, I am never going to drink again. Hmm. So she pulls herself out of the bed, walks in the living room, finds Samantha there, and she sits down and starts talking to Samantha, who tells her about her night and says, my gosh, Cindy, I had a great time. Uh, James was wonderful. I can't believe you haven't introduced me to him before. We really hit it off. Just had a fun time the whole night. And I asked Cindy, how was your night? And Cindy replies, I really can't remember a lot of it. Um, I remember being at the club and, you know, we were dancing, and, but the rest of it's pretty fuzzy after that. So Samantha tries to fill her in and says, well, yeah, we were dancing. Um, you fell down pretty hard there in a while. And Cindy's like, okay, that's how I got the bruise on my thigh. Um, you know, Jack took you home. And then this morning around four in the morning when I was getting a glass of water, I saw Jack leave in your room. And he left the apartment. So, how was your night? And Cindy freezes. She can't remember any of this happening. And she's thinking back to herself, you know, how did the night play out? Did I, what were my intentions going into the night? And she said, no, I was thinking I was just going to go dancing. But this, I don't know that I would have asked Jack up to my room. But, again, she doesn't know because she can't remember her thoughts. Um, so she keeps playing this over in her mind, thinking, my gosh, you know, did I really, could I have had sex with Jack? I don't know. And she starts worrying and concerned, what are people going to say at work? What happens if her boss finds out? Surely her boss is going to get her in a lot of trouble for this. What would she say to her parents? What would she say to her pastor if he were to find out? So she's pretty distraught right now. Uh, and she starts to cry, and Samantha can see you know, this emotion coming over a friend gets a little concerned and recommends to Cindy, hey, maybe we should go to the hospital. And Cindy's like, why do I need to go to the hospital? And 
Samantha relays, well, they can tell you if you had sex or not last night. So Cindy reluctantly agrees to go, and when they get there, talks to some of the practitioners, and they say, Cindy agrees to perform what's commonly known as a rape kit test. Um, so she does it only after she realizes it's confidential and the results of it will not be released to the Coast Guard without her permission. Now, it's a pretty intrusive test, and Cindy almost stops the practitioner three times because you know, it involves her stripping down, they have to swab her genitalia, they have to comb her pubic hair, uh, and it's, it's pretty, uh, she feels a lot of feelings of shame as this is going on. But she finishes the test and they ask her what she wants to do, whether she wants to file a police report or not. And she says no, no, she doesn't want to file a police report this time. Uh, she hasn't had, even had an opportunity to, to talk to Jack to think about this. I, you know, I don't even know what's gone on yet. I have no idea of what's happened. Um, but the results of the test say, that, let me back that up, the results have confirmed that she had had sex, but there was no forced trauma uh, that they could detect. So it was pretty clear in her mind that she had had sex with someone that night. Um, in her mind, most presumably Jack. So she gets back to her apartment um, and really starts to think about what her next options are. What should she do next? So in conclusion, and I'm painting with pretty broad strokes here, again, just to, to cover the broad basis of what the key points were, I would say that the first is that sin is really the, the, the foundation on which all sexual assaults can happen. It's, uh, and that maybe is a little bit of a cop-out, but because sin could be the source of just about any evil that we have in the world, but I it's also the first link of the air chain. If you remove sin from the equation, the next event doesn't happen. And that's true of many other things. You have, as I'm sure you heard in the case study, there were opportunities for intervention from people who were there who maybe could have taken proactive steps to eliminate progressive links in the chain to prevent things from going to where they did. Um, but it's that overall depravity that really makes a difference, and that's what I see happening in Jack himself, is that he is not someone who um, overnight became this way. It was the slow progression of sin maybe in his life. And the second part is maybe a little bit more difficult, and I wrestle with this still myself, but is that God's sovereignty can supersede his moral law. And I am going to point to Genesis in chapter 50 when Joseph says to his brothers after they try to reconcile with him, you know, you meant it for evil, trying to enslave me, but God meant it for good. And I think that's a hard perspective that something that was so evil and wrong and in God's eyes, from a moral standpoint, he could actually use for his glory and for his good. And I... I would lump sexual assault in this category, not that, uh, not that it's any kind of a good outcome, but that it, in a moral sense, but maybe in God's holy sense, it can be redeemed. And I think that makes the ethics particularly tricky, especially when you add the trauma that a victim feels and the changes that happen to their worldview. So that's what I have for a presentation. I do have a couple of discussion questions that we can go over here. In the, the next few minutes. Uh, first, who's responsible for Cindy's intoxication? Uh, did anyone involved act unethically? And does Cindy have an ethical responsibility to self report what happened? So I pose those to you. I don't have any particular order. You can jump out and answer either one that you might want to. We've had these discussions on me a lot. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have too. <laughs> <laughs> We're barely getting to know each other. <laughs> yep. Um, right out the gate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a tough one. I guess your first question, uh, I'll just go for it um, without giving them much thought. So throw rocks at them. Yeah, no attribution. Um, <laughs> when it, you know, having soldiers, when it comes down to. The, the army, for example, the army side of the house is really not defined. They try to stay away from it. Uh, the system is, is made so that the victim, be it a male or female, will not be questioned. Because the idea is that if you, you structure the system in a manner in which even you're going to help the person who was hurt, even if there's, there's, there's people edging and it didn't really happen, that's not the point. The point 
point is to make a system where it's, it's received. There's negative things about that because there, that means that some people um, who say that it didn't happen, even if it didn't happen, the way it's treated is as it did. So if you were accused and you were as a perpetrator, well, you're going to carry that. Right. You're going to be removed and all that kind of stuff. So, so even if it doesn't have an impact on your career per se on paper, perceptually it will. But th there's a reason for it, and and I really haven't given this much thought. I mean, this is a great ethical uh, um, application of what we've learned. Um, is this a content approach? Or is this a utilitarian approach? And it is a utilitarian approach from the perspective of the military. Um, it doesn't matter who gets harmed in the process as long as the majority of the people who have been hurt, really hurt, get addressed and get helped. The idea is to open the system so people feel comfortable, feel at ease with bringing the issues up. Um, so, that in mind, personally, and what we learned over here, um, who is responsible for, for intoxication? Unfortunately, the individual put themselves in that position in that scenario. Would I tell the victim that? Yeah. Would I treat the victim that way judgmentally? I wouldn't. Would I talk to my children about their decisions before this happens in their lives or in my daughters? Yes, I will have these conversations with them. But will I talk to the victim about it? Well, you, you put yourself in that. You went to a club and you were consuming alcohol. If you would have done that, if this happened, now this is the father in me talking, you know, because I'm thinking about my daughter, and I, there's, there's things that I have to do. Now, if my daughter still did it, um, she will eventually get her, herself come to the conclusion that if she would not place herself in that situation, that wouldn't have happened. So at, at that point, my concern is not making her feel that you made a mistake. My concern is finding the guy. Mm. <laughs> so, see, you see, so it's 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 not a definite. Um, we can intellectually see it, address it, but how we go about it is going to be dependent on on where we're at and which position. Are we in a leader role? Are we in a parent role? Are we in a recovery role? Are we in a preparation role? Yeah, but just because she ended up in a bar drunk doesn't mean things should have happened either. You know, I mean, you take however many people are there every night of the week. Does this happen every day? Is this, hey, if you go to the bar and get drunk, this is your end result. I don't think that's fair either. I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Because just because she went to the bar, drank too much, this should not have been her outcome. <coughs> So, you are. so, yes, she made a decision to drink, but she didn't make a decision to drink to the point that someone else could take advantage of it. So you, you both have touched on two aspects that get heavily involved in the cases like this, which are, uh, and they all revolve around consent. You know, when, and, and then you get into where do you assign responsibility. So I think Juan spoke correctly from the military's perspective in that you, uh, it's, it's not profitable on any sense, in any part of it to engage in victim blaming um, from the beginning because that is the, the more immediate feed. There may have been things that happened to get to that point of view, but, but you're right, and that's kind of a, a key issue and why I phrase the question this way is that just because you may have made choices to go get really drunk to the point you would black out doesn't mean that you deserve to be sexually assaulted. From a moral standpoint, I think that that's an important thing. But the ethics of it, again, are, are pretty tricky. You know, it is, uh, and that's what, focusing on the second question, I think gets a little bit more difficult. So you have someone who just experienced probably the most traumatic experience they've had in their life. Are they supposed to put themselves out there to, and all of their, their intimate things that have happened to them to be able to take the stand and discuss this so that they can get a conviction, or maybe get a conviction. 
In the military, you might be able to get a conviction right now. In a civilian court, not a chance if this is the, the events that happen, unfortunately. <coughs> it, seems, it, it seems, though, just going by the, the story, uh, to go from, and correct me if I'm wrong, just to go from her sharing some wine and whatnot, and then all of a sudden falling out, I mean, that seems like it would be like GHB. Like she was drugged. That's kind of what I, with, where I thought you were going. Um, so, knowing that, and obviously when she goes to the hospital the next day, they would obviously do a blood test and they would see if she was in fact drugged. I, I think that that was changing the, the entire dichotomy. Uh, uh, that second question is fantastic. I mean, <laughs> it's great, man. Because I'm sitting here thinking to myself, wow, uh, it, it's, it's difficult, particularly... But I think that if if she's in, if she's just solely intoxicated or whatnot, and 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 if she were drugged, I, I think that that changes that maybe even the answer to that. And and it's it's hard to to speak on on, on this topic without you know I mean it's delicate. Well, it, it most certainly is. From, from the beginning. Of the night, if you were counting, Cindy had between six and seven standard alcoholic beverages. Um, so that I didn't give you any demographics of what she's like. You know, she could be, she could be as tall as Brittany Griner. You know, like right. you know, or she could be, you know, really five foot and a hundred pounds soaking wet. What what we do what we do in the military and, and things going now in the military is always going to be. Uh, Whatever is best for the victim. So it's, that's because the stakeholders, which mm -hmm. is the civilian population, has held the, the, the army to a higher standard. Then they hold themselves. People are going to Congress and they're saying so many people, you know, suicide, so many people getting. So, so the stakeholders, the civilian population, are like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not going to use my tax money and then allow this to happen. So that's why it's postured that way. But when it comes down to the military, what we do is, is we do counsel, we do sit down, and even though we go to the church of counseling, we do not hold them accountable for the counseling. So, so we tell, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but for example, Colorado Springs, there's a high percentage of males being drugged in bars and being sexually abused. High. Um, and soldiers of that. So uh, what we tell them to do, and see, see, these are all decisions that you make. So I, I, I'm going to go a little bit against against you, but 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 not personally, okay? <laughs> it's, it's just bringing up the, the topic. What we do is we tell the soldier, if you are going to go to a bar, you let someone know. You go with somebody and you have an open discussion. Tonight I'm drinking. Are you going to drink? No. And people who are in my platoon or company <coughs> hold them accountable for that. So so if you were there with them and you were going to be the escort or the whatever you want to call it, right. you failed. You failed. If I played you Samantha's win. role in this case. I'm sorry? If I played Samantha's role in this case. That That is correct. And, and, we, and we actually counsel people for that. So you may, the victim may not get in trouble, but that person, that mm -hmm. battle buddy, that winning man concept, is going to get in trouble for failing... They're, they're battle buddy in that scenario. So what we do is we build control measures to prevent that from happening because it's already known. Does anybody here not know that if you go to a club and you leave your drink unguarded, you're going to end up with drugs in it? Does anybody here not know that? Anybody here? I guess common sense tells I mean, me, but I don't go out and drink, so I don't. Really? Okay, very for us in the, in the <laughs> Army, I mean, us in the army, I think it's more known that you don't just walk away from your drink. You know, I think no, no, in the, in the army, day. it is no, it is told to soldiers. I, I don't. Th I, I think that I think that it shows some some degree of hubris that the army is the only.